Dear Father in heaven, thank you for just the opportunity you give us to understand more of how we've been created and the things that impact our health that don't allow us to live to the fullest. And as we study these things, give us a brain and our minds that can understand and have the capability of, of reasoning these things out. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, this, this, the brain, basically it's, um, it's a, just such a breadth of information out there about the brain that I wouldn't even consider myself qualified in order to talk about this. So what I decided to do is to get information from what I see here and what we tested here um, and go from there. So I'm going to look today on the brain and I'm going to talk about the physical aspects of the brain. We, you see, this is one of the most important organs, if not the most important organ, because the decisions we take are based on two things, the brain and our gut. Those two things define our decisions. So what we do and the reasons we do the things we do are just found there. And also it impacts our whole health and we're going to look into why it does that. Um, everything you see, you smell, you taste, you hear is recorded in this part here in your brain. So it's just an amazing, um, amazing organ that God created. Now you'll see in English and Spanish, because I always have English and Spanish speakers in the class. So if just pick whichever it's going to be more appropriate for you. Um, I'm going to start with a Bible verse, which I think it sums up what I'm going to try to say. It says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Sobre toda cosa guardada, guarda tu corazón, porque él le mana la vida. In the Bible, many, many times the heart means the brain or the mind. It's up here. Um, and I think this one is referring to that. And we'll see why. We're going to specifically talk about the frontal lobe, that's what makes us different from any other creatures, is just our frontal lobe. So, <clears throat> the frontal lobe, um, it is this front cortex here and has a lot of functioning that, um, that makes us who we are. Okay, I'm just going to let it there. And now, here's the frontal lobe. Twist, change around, but this part is the frontal lobe of these animals. And we're going to look at the, the, the different animals here. The cat, el gato, it has a, is 3% of his front, uh, brain is frontal lobe. It's composed of his frontal lobe. The dog, or el perro, it is a 7.5% of his frontal lobe. It's, it's, um, it, uh, it's part of his brain, it's frontal lobe. Um, el mono, monkey, or simio, or whatever you call it, a monkey, is 17% of his brain is frontal lobe. Any humans, we're talking 33 to 38% of the brain is frontal lobe. Now, what gets your attention in this, in this um, numbers here? We have more than they do. We have more than they do. And what is the difference between us and them? We have some cognitive functions that these other animals don't have. And if you can see, the more frontal lobe, the more cognitive and interactions these animals can have. For example, the, the cats, they have some interactions with people, but you cannot tell them, go seek something or go you know, these, these, these um, hunters, they can shoot something and the dog goes and finds it and brings it back. I mean, it has some functions, cognitive functions that the cat really don't have. Now, I'm not saying, you know, if you have a cat that you like, um, doesn't mean that it's, it's a dumb cat, but it's not as smart as a dog. Now, the monkey, in itself, I, I went to um, the, the Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago, and I saw something very interesting. I saw a gorilla, and they have put a computer, like an iPad, in front of the gorilla. And the, he saw the iPad, 
and he would, these figures would come up in the screen. And he would have to pick the one he wanted to eat. So there were cucumbers and tomatoes, cherry tomatoes. And if he pick, if he pressed cucumber, a uh, cucumber would come out and he would eat it. If he pressed tomatoes, tomato would come out and he would eat it. So it's pretty interesting that once he knew he liked tomatoes, no matter if there were many cucumbers in the screen, he would pick that tomato because that's what he wanted to eat. So these animals are, are somewhat have more cognitive functions than the rest of the animals. Now, for us humans, we can have language and we can express ourselves into different um, ways, you know, that these animals might not be able to express themselves. So that's amazing. Now, what other thing you think you see that it's um, particular of these pictures? Be, not the pictures, the numbers. The pictures, they're not to scale. Just about doubles. Okay, that's great. It's about doubles, exactly. That's a good observation. Anything else that you can observe here? They're getting bigger. Yes, they're getting bigger. Anything else you see? Something glaring at you that just like, oh, you know. Different percentage on humans. Yes, there is a range on humans. Humans have a 33 to 38%, while the others are just, you know, hard set numbers. You know, the percentage means that, okay, I'm going to put, uh, I'm going to think, I'm going to think like an engineer, but I, uh, first question I'll ask is why? Okay, if, if bigger number means more cognitive function, the next question I'll have to ask is why? And how, which, where would you want to be? Do you want to be at the 33 or you want to be at the 38 percent? Huh? Yeah, I wonder, that's, that's the next question, right? But where would you like to be? Is it from the lobe or emotion? No. Memory. Okay. We'll look into what it is now. But, but just, just as a simple thing, you have more cognitive functions. You, you can interact better. You can, you could be, you're smarter, you could say. Okay? I would say 38%, right? Everybody would say 38%. How can I get to 38%? If I can get to a 38%, I would rather be 38% than 33%. Now, 33% it's still better better than a monkey, but but how can I get to 33 38%? That's the question where she says, yeah, that's the next question. Well, let me tell you how it develops. Your frontal lobe develops um until, okay, sorry, but it only develops until you're 30 years old. So if you're below 30 years old, you still can develop that frontal lobe. But if you're above it, you're set. It is what it is, okay? It is what it is. Now, it doesn't mean that you're not smart. It doesn't mean that you don't have cognitive functions. It means that it cannot expand anymore. Yours, it, it's set for you. But if you have children or grand, grandchildren, what we're going to talk about might be of interest so you can, you know, help those that can, so that they can develop a bigger frontal lobe. Yes. We'll talk about that. Okay. Well, I probably I misuse the word smarter. I'm just talking about cognitive functions, okay? Um, how you react to the world and things like that. Uh. So if you didn't go to school before 30, you're not going to be able to learn to read after 30. So, so yeah, um, let's see what the frontal lobe does, and then we'll answer that question, okay? Let's see what the functions of the frontal lobe are, and then we'll... we'll, we'll We'll define it. Now, it is interesting that at 30, at 30 um, 
ancient cultures would not give men positions of leadership before they were 30 years old. Actually, at 30 were the, the marking point that if they're going to get a leadership position, um, it was going to happen at 30. So, um, even, even for, um, in the Bible for Jesus, he started his ministry at 30. I wonder, how did they figure this out? It, it, there was no cell phones or TVs or radios or any distractions. These people had time to observe and pay attention to things. You see, when you have distractions, you, you focus on things and you kind of get, oh, that's, I can see behavior patterns. And they were able to see behavior patterns that at 30 years old, a man was kind of a mature person, would take mature decisions, I would say. Um, Alexander the Great... He conquered the world in three years, but he started at 33, 30 years old. Now, I would say he, he had problems because he, he drank too much, and by drinking too much, he just affected everything he had conquered in his life. So, um, so that was one thing that I saw with him. But Let's look at the functions of the frontal lobe. What are the functions? Well, functions are the following. Intellect. Part of your intellect is it's part of your frontal lobe. Reasoning. The reasoning capacity is part of your frontal lobe. Have you ever had a problem with somebody that you talk to someone and they just can't reason things out? you just like, you know, you're just, you're just like, okay, A, B, C, right? A, B, C. Well, you're talking to somebody like that and you go, A, B, C. I know you have everything against me. Oh! It goes emotional. It's like, what happened? A, B, C. No, it just became an emotional problem all of a sudden. What's the deal here? Have you anybody experienced any of that before? <laughs> it's just like, you're in a workplace and you see this very frequently. Now, that's a part of the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is responsible for reasoning capacity. So, you might think, well, maybe, maybe there are 33%. <laughs> that's why I'm trying to measure the 33%. No, it doesn't, need, it doesn't mean any, that there are 33%. It means that something up here just disconnected. It disconnected. Or, or have you had, maybe it's a spouse. It could be a spouse for all we say. That, you know, w some days you can talk to your spouse and we could reason things out and everything works out perfectly. And some others is like, where are you coming from? Yes. You know, you know there's thinkers and there's feelers. I'm a thinker, my husband is a feeler. We'll, we'll, we'll see if that's true. If that theory is true, in a minute here. But anybody that has a frontal lobe over 33% can, it's able to reason things out, okay? Has the capability of reasoning. Nobody else, nobody can say, unless you have problems in your frontal lobe, you can reason, okay? Um, judgment. Judgment is also part of the frontal lobe. I am, am I amazed by parents that give responsibility to the little children, they're seven, eight, nine years old, and they're giving in capabilities of reasoning, of judgment to these little children. They're gonna mess up. I remember the things that I did when I was young. My frontal lobe was still development, in development mode. And I remember doing the craziest things that you can even imagine, that if I, when I remember, it's like, oh my goodness, I would never, ever do something like that right now. What was I thinking? I mean, I'm telling you the things that I used to do. Um, uh, no, we weren't thinking. Our, our, our judgment was lacking at that moment. So, to give a responsibility of judgment to somebody that is, hasn't uh, developed frontal lobe, it's kind of a mistake. And sometimes, you know, oh, you know what, just let them learn. 
No, you have to know that the limitations here in judgment. Or, 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 what would get a man with a good family, good wife, good children, all of a sudden go after a younger uh, woman that cannot do even half of what your, the wife can do, it's not offering anything that, the, that already he has, and it's going to cause more trouble. What in the world would get that man thinking? What is he thinking? You see, that's a lack of judgment. Now, has a frontal lobe developed, it's already a mature man, what would he, what would he be thinking? There's, 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 we're going to have to look and uncover how this thing sometimes just disconnect, stop working where it needs to work, Okay. I mean, when you understand what we're facing in this society, you've got to understand the reasonings why, okay? Now, willpower, fuerza de voluntad, willpower is also part of the frontal lobe. Willpower. Now, this is the power of decision. This is the most powerful weapon you have. This is where you have your strength. It is in your willpower. Sometimes we say, oh, we lack willpower. I don't have willpower. Well, willpower, it's interesting because all these functions of the frontal lobe depends on willpower and the exercise of the willpower. If you exercise the willpower, your frontal lobe develops. So if you have a child or you're not yet 30, the way you develop your frontal lobe to get to 38% is the exercise of the willpower. So how do you do the exercise of the willpower? Well, it is by having clear demarked lines of what's good or what's bad, what's, what's um, right and what's wrong, what's allowable and what's not allowable. When parents have strict demarked lines that the child knows this is what it is and this is not what it is, the frontal lobe develops. If you want a smarter child, you make that box very clear to them that they understand what it is. See, it cannot be one day I say yes and one day I say no. It's just, there's blur, it's just blurs the, the lines, okay? It's always have to be very consistent and very marked. There is a cause and there is an effect. When I say something, it means what I say. You see, the biggest problem with frontal lobe development is that parents don't do this. They're too tired to parent. They're too busy to parent. So they, don't, they, they cannot keep up with this growing mind that is exploring and is doing all these things and he's learning these things and these child don't have any boundaries when they have no boundaries their frontal lobe not developed there is a there's a program I didn't understand the ins and out of it until I went to a psychology class in college but there was this program in Puerto Rico where I grew up and it called it was called Ogares Crea um, is Crea was a how do you call it, an acrostic to something. I forgot what it what meant. But what they would do, they would take these people that have addiction problems, and they were addiction problems, or they had, um, they, were, they wanted to restore them back into the society. And what they would do, they would take them into this place. It would, it, I don't know if it was a jail or type of, the, I don't know what it was, the details of it, but I know what I saw. They would take them, and they would, they would, they would um, shave their heads. Now, at that time, when this program was happening, nobody wanted to have their, sh their heads shaved. Now it's, it's normal to have your head shaved. Um, if you're going bold or something, you just shave your head. But it was not something that was common. So they would shave their heads, and they were all had one type of teacher. It was a yellow teacher, I think. It was yellow, and I don't know what color the pant was. But, um, but I remember that they had a different way of dressing, and they would put them to work in the streets, 
either cleaning the streets or they would sell um, trash bags. They would, they would knock at your house and sell trash bags. Now, when you see a, a person like that, you know, he knows that you know where he's, where he's at. And all these things were, were done for a reason. It's because this child had never had any boundaries. That's what they thought. These had any boundaries at her home. So they were putting them, they were bringing them that, to that experience of a child and humbling them. Because having a shaved head, it was a humbling experience. And then the yellow shirt was a humbling experience. But as they worked through this program, they were supposed to get back into society again. That was kind of the mechanism. So having clear boundaries is very important. Um, these shows in TV got very popular, Super Nanny, Dr. Phil, and the only thing that they did was, you know, when a parent says something, it means what it says. And when that's, that's put into the brain of that child, that willpower strengthens because he can decide what he wants. If you go out of here, there's an effect of moving away from the words of your parents. Okay, now the will is something that it needs to be taken care of like a vine. Now, if you have a vine, you have to guide it. We have some we, 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 um, we um, planted this year, and it's, it's um, grapes, right? And you have to guide it through so it goes to where it needs to. Now, what happens if you're too hard on it? It breaks. Sometimes, again, because parents are too busy or are too sloppy or careless, they want to enforce force and break the will of that child. When they break the will of that child, they destroy the frontal lobe experience. They cannot develop their frontal lobe because they've been broken down with strength. Another way is just let them do what they want to do. They're going to grow up like I grow up, but I, I survived. Well, the problem with that is that what is that vine going to go? Anybody seen it? It's just going to go to the floor and all over the place. It's going to go where you don't want him to go. Okay? Now, what if, giving you an example, I have a child here. I'm going to call him Jimmy. Let's, let's pick Jimmy for the... Jimmy. Jimmy. We found Jimmy. And mommy tells Jimmy, Jimmy, I want you to sit in this chair. And Jimmy is sitting in this chair, right? Mommy says, I don't want you to get up the chair. Sit, stay sitting in this chair. And Jimmy is sitting in this chair. But what happens to Jimmy? Jimmy is full of energy. Just like a regular child is full of energy. So, since he's full of energy, does he want to stay sitting in the chair? No. So, as soon as mom looks the other way around, what is Jimmy going to do? Jimmy is going to go like this. And he swings. Now, what is he doing? He's getting out of the chair halfway, partially half of the chair, right? He's still in the chair, according to him. Because his hands are here, are touching the chair, but he's, and he's looking and seeing, what does that adult friend of mine is means with, don't get off the chair, right? So, you know, he's looking, he's looking, he's looking, and all of a sudden he goes, you know, he's trying to figure out what's going to happen here, what it's going to happen here. So now, mommy told Jimmy, sit here. And Jimmy is trying to decipher what he wants to do, right? He's trying to challenge her, right? And now what happens? When mommy sees him that he's out and about, what does mommy do? Jimmy, did I tell you to get on the chair, right? That's what she does. And Jimmy goes to the chair and sits. That's what typically happens. But let's assume that there was all these this. There was a thistle plant. 
una ortiga. Ortiga, creo que se llama en español. Anyways, a thistle plant right in the foot where, where he should, you know, on the floor. And he's, um, he's barefooted. And he steps on it when he gets up. Ah! And he'll start crying, right? That reaction in him will cause a memory. And it will cause, it will be an effect to what mommy said, to the command that mommy said. So next time when mommy says, hey, Jimmy, stay on the chair, even if Jimmy has to do this, he'll stay on the chair. He won't get up. But that's not, you don't have thistles in the floor where mommy says, sit and stay there. That doesn't happen. What really happens is that he goes up, when mommy looks her out, he goes and does his little thing, what he wants to do. And then mommy goes, Jimmy, I told you to get on the chair. And he goes to the chair. And it goes on and on. Jimmy, I told you to get back to the chair. And he goes back out. Jimmy, did I tell you not to get out of the chair? And he goes back to the chair. But he knows that, you know, nothing happened to me. It's okay. Now, what really happens is that mommy is upset. And it's up to the point. You see, children had a way of knowing how to press those buttons. They have like a, they have like a, a computer in their brain that they just go, here's the button I'm going to press. And they start pressing. Look, they want a cell phone, right? And you say, I don't want you to play games on my cell phone. And they want that cell phone. So you're come tired from work, you're, uh, you're doing, you know, if it's mommy, she's cooking and doing all these things and going up and down and doing all these things, right? She's tired. And all of a sudden, they start, can I have the cell phone? You're busy. You're like, you know, they know when to ask. Or, or opportunistic. A friend of yours comes to the house, right? And they ask at that time, knowing that, you know, they have a, an advantage over you, right? Or grandparents came out, and everybody's, ha they have, and they just go, can I have it, 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 can I have it? They're searching for that button. Can I have it, 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 yes, just have it, get away from me. They got it. They are very opportunistic. They know exactly what you left because you know it's true. Huh? They know mine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> every, every, every child is a school in training. There's no saint. They're all in training. Okay? So now, mommy is here and she sees that Jimmy. It is the hundredth time that she's telling Jimmy to go back to the chair. So what does mommy do? Jimmy, did I tell you to go back to the chair? Wait a minute. At that time, and the crying starts. And what just happened? What happened was that there is a sensor here, which is an alarm system of the brain, of the body, which keeps you alert to things. It allows you to react to things. It's called the amygdala. So this part is where the limbic system is and is your emotional center. This screaming caused an emotional response, which is not what you wanted. You wanted the frontal lobe to be engaged, not the limbic system. So now, what's happening? There's an emotional response, and that emotional response is not going to get the effect that you wanted, the memory you wanted. Okay, next time the same scenario is gonna come back again. Jimmy sits and Jimmy, I know how many times I have to tell you're gonna get to the same spot all the time. It's a repetitive process, never gets anywhere. Now, what happens is I would say probably some of us have experienced this type of you know, we grew up in this system, so you know, our, our lives becomes very emotional center, 
We're very emotional people. We, you know, the same people that sit down to see a movie and any movie, <laughs> I can't stop crying. It's like, no, it's a movie. It's not a, just everything is emotional. Why is everything emotional? Because this part here is bypassed and here is where the center of all the decisions, every reaction to anything is it's happening. Um, <clears throat> so what we want is to exercise the will so that this part is strong. Okay? This is a strong, but it needs to be strong. And if we find ourselves in this mode of operandi, where we're operating on the emotional side, on the amygdala side, we have to figure out how to activate this thing again, okay? Now, I had someone here come that couldn't sleep for two, five, for three months. Now, when I'm saying couldn't sleep, not even two hours of sleep, okay? Not even two hours, just like wired. And um, it was an amygdala problem. Your amygdala is there for protecting you. Um, let's say you're, you're somewhere, um, let's say southern Texas, where there's all these snakes in southern Texas. If you know anything about Texas, somebody told me, you're never going to see a cat in a shelter in southern Texas. They, everybody has cats in their house. Why? Because there's, there's snakes, and the cats get um, rid of those snakes, you know, at, least, at least from the house close to the house. So anyways, you know this and you're going to visit friends. Now you're from the north here. We don't use cowboy boots like they do over there because then we don't have snakes here like like that. I mean, we do, but not like that. So you're visiting that friend. You're in the yard and you're walking with your, you know, it's warm. It's hot in Texas. You're, you have your sandals on and you're walking in the yard. And while you're walking, you see this black thing with the corner of your eye, what would happen? Boom, as soon as you see that with the corner of your eye, everything will start. Look what happens. Your blood is gonna go rushing to this area of your body, right here, and to your frontal lobe, and to this part here. Digestion will stop immediately. Obviously, you cannot digest when you're in stress mode. You're in alert mode. And as soon as you do like this, it's a hose. It's a black hose. What happens? All of a sudden, you know, you saw something, your frontal lobe gets engaged, calm down, everything is cool, no worries. And your frontal lobe took action, have reasoning capacity, and made sense out of the circumstances. Well, when somebody has their amygdala overactivated and it just can't get you cannot turn it off, that person see that host and still scream like it's a snake and gets up. Ah! And everybody can tell him it's a host and you just can't shut it off. This thing, when it's super activated, I mean, it's just, you're super anxious. Anxiety comes from this thing here. It's, it's an overactivated amygdala. You're always on alert mode. Something is gonna happen to you. Panic attacks, right here. This is where it goes, you know, you're just super alert, super activated, things are going to hurt you. So, um, you know, when you have that problem, the first thing I would say, don't watch regular TV. First thing you would do, not watch any regular TV. Because, you see, when you watch a movie or any regular TV, you know, the, the wavelengths, the blue wavelengths that are coming from the TV, you'll see it, they change every three seconds two to three seconds, the, 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 the frame, the scene changes. So you see the face of the person, count one, two, commercials are really good with this. One, two, three, and then change the frame. One, two, three, they change the frame. That creates, you don't understand it, but it creates this wavelength that it just bypasses, it just numbs your, your frontal lobe and activate your, your amygdala, your limbus system. That's why you could be sitting in a, in a movie and you could be like this and not talking and people can go by and you're like you see but when you see like um, 
something like a documentary or you could see um, um, C-SPAN, which is just, you know, or you could see a debate, uh, a debate. You could be screaming at the screen, oh, you know, do this. Because you're interacting, your frontal lobe is engaged. But once you deactivate it with a movie, for example, which actually the purpose of the movie is to get you engaged and get to your emotional center, um, it would deactivate this. And since you have this problem, you have to take care of it because uh, if you don't ever engage this, the next step is depression. Okay? So you need to start engaging this with activities that engage it. And we'll talk about that later. Okay. This is the most, most important slide of the whole talk. Okay? Brain requirements. And we're going to start now going to the physical part of things. We're going to see how this physical organ works. Um, it uses 33% of the glucose, of the sugar that your body gets, your brain. It's headquarters, so just think about it. Okay, you eat a banana. Let me put it in perspective. You eat a banana, a third of that banana is just going to go through your brain. The energy from that banana, nutrients and energy, are going to go to the brain. I mean, you have a big body here with muscles and things to do, but a 33% of the sugar or the glucose that your body gets goes to the brain. That it's a big demand. Now, this is the most important statement that I'm going to say today. It can only store, so it, for reserves, it can only store two minutes. Only two minutes of reserve. What does that mean? You've got to feed it all the time. It has to be a constant feed if you want to have that brain working. When your brain doesn't work, it's because it's not fed. So you need to constantly feed the brain. That's what I'm saying. It's like having a big truck with a very small tank. You can't go very far on that, on that truck. 20% of all the oxygen your body has is going to go to the brain. So when there's no oxygen, you're going to feel sleepy. So you have to know how to breathe because every five breaths, one is going to go to feed the brain. That's credible. It's 85% water. Now, you're saying the brain is 85%. that's what they say. I think it's less than that, but it, that's what people say. It's fat and water. So imagine if you don't drink enough water, it's like a, it's, it's like a racing. Um, now, this is the statistics from the, from the government agency. I think it's way higher than this. It says 20% of the population suffers from mental health problems. 20%. Um, I think it's way higher than that. I think it's in the 70%. So we're in good company, people. 11% um, <clears throat> of teenagers suffer depression. Just depression, 11% of teenagers. Now, if this is not a crisis, I don't know what it is, okay? People are talking about Ebola and this, and that's not, that's not even close. This is, this is a big problem, you know? Um, yeah, I'm not going to go into it, but I'm just going to give you some information. Different dimensions on health, mental. Nine out of ten diseases originate on the mind. Nine out of ten diseases originate on the mind. Nine out of ten. That's a lot. Now, how do I know I have a mental condition? That's the second question. We'll, we'll see it at the end. Ask me that question at the end. I'll explain why. How do I know if I have mental conditions? That's the key, you know, because these things are not typically diagnosed until you go to the doctor where you have a problem, right? Okay, if you experience five of these nine symptoms for the last two weeks, 
deep sadness and emptiness, apathy or loss of interest, agitation or slowdown, sleep disturbances, weight or appetite changes, lack of concentration, feeling of worthlessness, fatigue, morbid thoughts, then you do have a mental disorder. Um, so you could find that there's, if there's five of these hits, then you do. And these hits, um, if you have three, if you have three, you have mild depression. More, it's a major depression, okay, on these. Now, <clears throat> most of the depression hits are based on your frontal lobe, the activity of frontal lobe. When you're depressed, your frontal lobe is not engaged. Hardly gets any blood flow to it, okay? So when there's depression, there's hardly any blood flow to the frontal lobe. I'm going to give you some ideas of what I see here, okay? You might agree or disagree. I'm just going to give you data. I'm not going to go into all the details of it because of the t time. Um, you know, the problem with these things is that people engage this frontal lobe with, with, with um, chemical things. For example, um, sodas, caffeine, caffeinated sodas, or um, chocolate, sugar, um, cocaine, pornography, um, et cetera, et cetera. These things engage your brain artificially, trying to engage. And what, what basically it's a need, it's a response of the brain to, to see that it's alive. The brain is like always have a sensor trying to get alive. For example, you see somebody, you see sit him down. Right? The person is like, have you seen this? All the time. And you, do you say, what, why is it anxious? What's going on? The person might not be anxious, but it's just like this. Well, that's a sense, sense um, that's a signal sent to the brain saying, am I there? Are you alive? Are you alive? So there, that, that is a pattern of brain degeneration. Okay? So, um, yeah, sometimes it's okay if you're if it's anxiety, but you see a repeated thing is brain degeneration, and and brain degeneration is going to cause other diseases, not just mental diseases. Okay, now um, I think the reason, and this is this is a reason from what I see, that the brain gets sick. One of the major reasons the brain gets sick is how it manages sugar, well, how it manages sugar. When I'm saying sugar, you see that there's either fruits or there's, you know, junk stuff there. It does not matter what type of sugar. It could be a potato. It could be a, a sweet potato. It could be anything. How does your brain manage it once it gets in? What does it do with it? Okay, so sugar management is why I think there's a lot of mental problems. A lot of them, and we'll see why. And this is this is um, what the data we have. Um, your body likes to have um, the sugar in the blood to be from 60 milligrams per deciliter to 100 milligrams per deciliter when you're in fasting mode. Okay, normal, not after right after eat, but eating. But this is what's normal. Now, if, the, if it goes too high over 100 for a long period of time, what happens to your body? Well, insulin, kicks in. insulin kicks in. And stores, in fat. stores in fat. But why does it do that? What's the reaction? Why does the body doesn't want sugar in the blood, in the blood like that? What does it cause? Having too much sugar in your blood, what causes? What, what, what problem does it give you? So start giving you problems with your kidneys, your eyesight, fatigue. You have a lot of problems that the body's starting to, uh, to, to try to adjust to because he doesn't want the sugar this high. But what happens if the sugar is this low? It's high and you don't have, you don't have glucose 
Yeah, the first thing that affects below here is your brain. Your brain is not working very well. I had people here that, you know, I had, um, they, were, they were at 20. Their blood sugar would go at 20. And you would see them, they were like this. Uh, are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Like that. Crazy stuff. Crazy stuff. I want to check. Um, now, I, I checked one time, and I was studying this and researching this, and happened that I had a specific case, and the person came here, and his sugar level was 45. And he was normal. I mean, you couldn't even tell that he was low, or he was just fine and dandy. And he was diagnosed by, um, with a problem of bipolar disease and something else. So his wife brought him here and said, this is it. This is the last straw. If does, this doesn't work, I'm leaving him. I have another child in my home. I just can't deal with it. And I'm like, wow. Um, so I tested him, and he was 45. I was like, hmm. I, I start asking questions. And does he feel persecuted? Yes. Yeah, she says, he doesn't even turn on TV because he's thinking that they're thinking that he's, they're going to watch him. And he doesn't do this and he doesn't do that. And, and I was like, check, 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 check. This is schizophrenia. This is not, this is not anything other than that. Because I have seen this pattern and I've been, I've been, you know, documenting this pattern and it's, this and that and there's extreme desire for for things sexually i mean sexual things sexual conversation check all these things were just regular patterns there i'm like hmm and i was like okay the guy was skinny and i put him on a six day lemon fast which i won't do for skinny people i won't do because i don't they don't have enough fat and i remember that day five, I mean, he, the guy was normal. Everything was good. I mean, he was just on fire. First one in exercise, said, okay, let's read the Bible. He was the first one that wanted to read. He wanted to, I mean, he just. The whole, whole six days? Um, at, the end, at the end of the six days. His wife was so impressed by him that she says, I want to get into the program myself. Can I start doing the program? And I said, yeah, go ahead. And um, I was just so excited, so excited that he came back as a volunteer later on. Um, and he's doing fine. He's doing w really, really good. Um, and I see many cases. I've seen cases where, where um, well, I'll talk about them later. But anyways, this is where the, the, the body wants to be as much as it can. And the brain loves it. The more it's here, the brain loves it. When it's down here, forget it. Now, refined sugar. When I say refined sugar, I'm talking about sugar itself. Anything that has sugar. Sugar you buy in the store. Sugar is a chemical. It's not in nature. You don't get sugar in nature. In the structure that is crystallized sugar, or refined sugar, you don't get it that way. And this refined sugar, maybe in candy, sodas, um, all these things you put sugar on, this is what the response in the body is. You get an insulin, you get, you get a spike over the levels, the normal levels, and then you get insulin response that brings it down. But it seems so much to the body, which it is, that the insulin response is so high that it brings really, really low the sugar in your blood. So it creates a big, big dip in it. It is, it is very interesting to see that you go to a, a bank or you go to a, a doctor's office and the first thing you see on the table there on the counter is what? A bowl of what? Cookies. Candy, lollipops, right? It's just always there. You say, why? Well, maybe it's because they know that parents come with the little children and they, um, they had to sit for a waiting line. And they have to sit for a waiting line. And you know, children don't want to sit for a waiting line. We talk about it initially. So 
One sit here, another sit here. Mommy is here waiting in line for that ticket to get things moving. And the boys are what? They're just running around and doing things. So she, what does she do? She goes, picks those lollipops up, give them to the children. And what do the children do? As long as they have a lollipop, they're calm in their chair. They don't move. It is great stuff. It works. It's what she wanted. They're there. They're obedient. What happens to the sugar? They're up here. But immediately, not too long from it, mom has now been called and the children starts. Give me that. Ah, that's mine. Ah, 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 here. Ah. And mom goes, okay, I'm almost going to be called. Hold on. Take it easy. I'm going to buy you a toy if you behave after we leave this, this place. Mommy's trying to reason when the children are here. Can she reason? Can, can the boys have capacity to reason down here? Why not? The brain doesn't have any energy to do anything. That frontal lobe is completely disconnected. It's not active, so you cannot reason with that child at the moment. I'm saying you want disobedient children, give them candy. It's very effective. Very effective. If you give them candy, you get them disobedient very easily. Why? Not because the children want to be disobedient. It's because you disconnect the frontal lobe. They cannot do any otherwise. Grandparents, don't create a mess for your chi children. Okay? You know who you are. Grains or cereals, they're even worse. Grains or cereals. When I'm talking grains or cereals, I'm talking oats, rice, I'm talking corn, I'm talking wheat, I'm talking barley, I'm talking all these cereals. Now, it's like, wow! They even have a higher spike than refined sugar and a more rapid low. That's why on Saturday when we ate that cereal, we got hungry very quickly. We were starving by the time we got here. Like, oh, what is the food? I was starving at church. So why is that? It's just the cereals, basically what they have, they have a chain of starches. And these starches are digested by an enzyme called amylase. And this amylase um, enzyme, it's in the mouth. So as soon as you eat these grains or these cereals, it sends a signal to the brain there's a lot of sugar because the chains, there's a big number of chains of, of sugars all clustered together, really clustered together. So it has more sugar than anything else these starches have. There's such concentrated cluster of sugars. So um, when the person starts digesting these things in the mouth, there's a sugar spike, big sugar spike, and there's a big low. Now, I'm not saying they're bad for you, okay? It's not coming out of my mouth that they're bad for you. What is coming out of my mouth is saying that they have this impact in your, in your body, okay? It goes down here. So what happens is that um, in the 19... I think four, 50s and 60s, there was a big depression and Mexico and India were one of the big impacts. There are large countries, a lot of population, their diet, staple diets is grains, cereal stuff, right? Corn, rice, things of like that, or wheat. So um, some scientists got together and said, you know what, these starches, starches normally are not Totally di were no totally digestible. So before a starch like a wheat starch or a rice starch or a um, or a um, oat starch, the um, the the starches didn't completely separate. There were some separated a little bit by cooking or something, but they didn't separate it completely. So you would get some of the energy of these starches and the rest will just go down and you just poop it out mostly intact, okay? Now, these scientists got together and said this is dumb because the staple food of these poor countries that are struggling at this moment is grains. 
what if we can find a way by hybridization to go in and, and untangle these starches a little bit more? So when they're used, they're actually you get more energy out of them than you're getting now. Imagine just having a package of energy and somebody needs the energy to survive and you're just giving them a little bit. So um, they hybridize these things and all of them got hybridized. Nobody can say that it's not, oh, I got something more original that it's not. Everyone got the same thing. It's just, it just, after that time, everyone has. So these starches are really soft in the sense that you, it opens up once you eat it in your mouth and that's what you release. Now, a, a tactic to do, and nutritionists do this, could suggest this. It's, um, let's for example, you, kick, you cook rice, which just releases the starches up. And then what you do, you cool it down. Cool it down. So then you eat a little bit of a cold rice after it's cooked. And that time, the starches go back together. So now it doesn't release the sugar that it does. And I think that some, some nutritionists do it for diabetics. They just say, you know, eat the, the starches cold because it, it, it t you know, takes out the effect. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not saying it's bad or good. I'm just saying there's an impact on the starches and, and how it's digestible. I'm not saying this don't eat rice, or I'm not saying don't eat this. I'm just saying this is what happens. You have to pick, you know, if you have a brain condition, you have to know how it works in your body is what I'm saying. And you have to know the repercussions in your life and the life around of the people around you. You have to make sure. The same is with you know, the pastas and the things of that sort, they tell them, you know, just let them cold so that the starches don't, don't um, separate as much. So that's one of the things. The next thing is caffeine. Now, it's interesting because caffeine do not have, you cannot, you could eat, drink a coffee without sugar or some five energy without sugar. So why would caffeine have this, this distribution where it gives you this low of sugar. Well, the thing is that caffeine creates a stress response in the body. Caffeine is like, I've been, I think in the book, Caffeine Blues, he says that, the author says that it is like bringing a, a tiger into this room. When you bring a tiger into this room, imagine if a tiger comes into this room, just open up like this through these, Curtains and just come here. Immediately, immediately, your amygdala goes off, right? And your reaction to stress comes up. Your digestion stops, which I find very interesting that people eat with coffee. They eat a piece of bread or eat this or that. Or after the meal, they have a, a, a coffee. Because immediately after you have that coffee response, caffeine response, the, the digestion stops because you got a stress response. You don't want to be eating while you have running, a, um, you know, a tiger is running behind you. It's not possible. So your body shuts down the digestive process. Now, some people say, oh, that's why I have acidity problem. Yes, yeah, you stop coffee, you stop acidity problems because, why? Because you, you're eating with coffee. So <clears throat> you create the stress response. Immediately what's going to happen Cortisol is going to get released. Cortisol is the hormone that manages stress, help you manage stress. So when cortisol is released, the main, one of the main purposes of, of cortisol is to start burning any fat storage or any glycogen storage to be produced into the, to send it to the bloodstream because you might need energy to run or do something. So you get a sugar release from your storage and that's what happened at night like for example you have diabetes here i didn't understand this when i got here where i got diabetes diabetic pe people that they would come in and their blood sugar was uh, um probably at 80 or 90 before they went to bed and by the time i checked them in the morning it was 130 and i'm like are you eating is there anything in your bed? You just went to bed and now you, you came with... So what happens is that at night, 
your brain is saying, I don't have any sugar. So cortisol gets released and it burns your storage and it brings the sugar up. So you don't die when you're sleeping. So that's what happens with caffeine too. It releases a stress response, you burn fat because of it. And then it's a, I mean you burn sugar because of it and it goes really low. And most people that drink coffee, they have chronic um, tired. They're chronically tired. They're always tired, but they can't sleep well. Um, now, this is interesting. And this is, this is, I was not even looking into this. I found it out by mistake with, when I started seeing type 1 diabetic um, guest. Here's the distribution of salad. It's all even for a long period of time. So your brain is more alert for a more period of time when you eat salads. So it is not surprising then that I, th I forgot the doctor's name. I can't find it if you want to. That says, if you are going to divorce, if you have your spouse and you're thinking of divorce, the first thing you need to do is a glucose tolerance test. And the reason you would do a glucose tolerance test is that if the spouse is having time here because of these patterns, if there's a lot of time that things are going here, you're going to have problems with reasoning, you're going to have problems with lack of judgment, you're going to have problems with, um, with um, willpower, you're going to have problems with um, intellect. So maybe you're in an argument with your spouse and you're like, uh, arguing with, with her or him. Don't get together along. I just can't figure out reasoning things together. It makes sense. Well, that person might be here mo most of the time. So the brain cannot really get to where it needs to be to reason things out and say, okay, you know what? Oh, so... Then you see that after you divorced and did all these things, you realize, man, we, we should not have done this. Why? Well, you know, look at all the cereals, look at all the sugars, look at all the caffeine, look at all these things. I mean, they go, you, you cannot defy your nature. It is what it is. It creates other problems. It creates other problems we'll talk tomorrow. Huh? It eventually affects the brain, yes. Mm -hmm. It deteriorates the brain, yes. Um, for example, somebody that drinks alcohol and gets um, drunk by it, you see their brain affected immediately. Uh, slowly, cannot reason very well because it just, you know, it thinks it's going to turn here, but it just, you know, turns a little bit. So. It's erratic, it's walk is erratic, movement is part of the frontal lobe too. So these things start getting erratic. The, the inhibitions go, you see your restraining power, it's, it's, it's in, the, in the frontal lobe. There's hardly any inhibition, you say things that you won't say any otherwise. So yeah, it affects your frontal lobe immediately. Now, <clears throat> mechanisms to manage sugar. Now I told you half of the story. This is half of the story. This is not the complete story. Your brain, your body has checks and balances to overcome this problem. Here's one of them. Thyroid. Thyroides. Now, thyroid produces thyroxine. Thyroid produces thyroxine that controls the, me the metabolism. Now, my question to you is, when it releases, when the thyroid releases thyroxine, does it bring the blood up, in, the sugar in, up in the blood, or does it bring it down? Brings it down? It actually brings it up. It, it, uh, sorry, it allows you to burn the, sh the fat storage into glucose, converts it into energy. So you have energy, you have glucose. So that's what thyroxine does. Now, the pancreas produces insulin. Now, insulin regulates glucose. It brings glucose into the cells. Does it bring the sugar up or down in the body? Brings it up. It brings it down. You, you take insulin to bring the sugar down 
for you, the insulin brings the sugar down. Now, what about, it produces glucagon, also the pancreas. Now, it's a hormone also that converts uh, fats into, into glucose. Does it bring the sugar up or down in the blood? It brings it up, yes, it brings it up. Now, you're seeing a pattern, the pituitary gland releases HGH, human growth hormone. Now, it regulates metabolism and growth. Does it bring the sugar in the blood up or down? Don't know? Anybody guess? Down? It brings it up. Brings it up. Now, you have your adrenal glands. You've seen a pattern here, your adrenal glands. Adrenal glands are on top of your kidneys up here. And they're small, but very powerful. They are the ones that work your inflammation, glucocorticoid. So for example, what if you use prednisone, your, it comes from here, your, your, your anti-inflammatory um, hormones or chemicals come from here, from the adrenal glands. So if you're not producing good uh, um, glucocorticoids, you're going to have inflammation, and they have to act artificially give you that. So this is for um, producing your anti-inflammatory agents. It produces also um, your stress response, adrenaline, um, noradrenaline, and cortisol. These are when you have um, stress, it is produced, these hormones are produced here to manage the stress, okay? They also produce your sex hormones, your estrogen, your testosterone, they come, they come from here. So these, these little guys do a lot. So do they bring the sugar up in the blood or down? What do you think? It's up, you see the pattern, it's up, right. Some people have a problem with sleeping that they go to bed, boom, and they sleep, and then all of a sudden, from 2 to 4 in the morning, boom, they're up. And they just go down, boom, and you want to sleep. It's not like you want to stay up, you want to sleep. You say, I want to sleep more, but I'm waking up at that time every time. Why is that? Well, it's very simple. Your brain needs sugar. How much sugar? All the time. You have only two minute reserves. And you're eating at night? You're not eating at night, right? You're fasting at night. So you're fasting at night and the brain is like, oh, I'm getting out of sugar. I'm getting out of sugar. Well, at two in the morning, these guys are supposed to release cortisol. And it's Cortisol comes up and says, okay, I'm ready to work. And it starts burning the storage of sugar in your muscles and your liver. It starts burning it up, and you get the sugar you need, and the brain is, and you fall asleep. What, but when these things are not working too much because of the ups and downs and ups and downs, every time you eat a cereal, every time you eat sugar, every time you eat caffeine, the sugar goes low, and then they bring it up, and then go low, and bring it up, and then you have stress problems. Oh, stress here, stress there, stress. These, snacking, snacking meals, all these stuff. Now you have these guys very tired, extremely tired. So two in the morning comes, and the brain is like, hey, wake up, what's going on, what's going on? Hey, 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 hey. By four in the morning or three in the morning, it's like, Ramon, wake up, wake up, wake up. I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying. No sugar, I'm dying. And boom, wakes you up. And what does it go? Oh, I have to do this, I have to do this. You don't gonna go, you're not gonna go to sleep. You're not gonna go to sleep. What, what's going on? Oh, I have to do this tomorrow. I didn't do this. This is happening here. This is happening there. Is the brain saying, I don't wanna go. You got to do something. This is not working. You have tired it by the stress and the eating these things that go up and down. Now, God made six hormones that 
bring the, uh, it's in Spanish, but six hormones that bring the glucose up and one hormone to bring it down. Six to one. Six to bring it up, one down. Why? Why did he design you that way? Because the brain's going to be bringing it down. Because, yes, in order to reason, you need to have sugar. So, in order to reason, you need to have sugar. God cannot reason with anyone. He's, he doesn't want animals. He wants people to reason. Now, look at a typical breakfast. Typical breakfast. Let's look. Let's, let's analyze it. What's this? Grains. What is this? Sugar. What is this? Caffeine. Are you kidding me? What is this? Extreme sugar. This is not one orange. This is many oranges there together. I mean, same thing. Cereals, grains. You know, the same pattern all over the place. No wonder we have depression. No wonder we have problems with with our brains. No wonder we can't sleep well. I mean, these things are not there because magically appear. It, they're there because I mean, we feed them through our lifetime. No wonder there's so many divorces. I can't get, you know, there's no wonder there's problems at work where you can't talk to your co-workers and get to a point that we can all agree on something. Families, they can't agree on anything. Why? Because they can't reason together. It's all emotional. Ah, it just, you know? Now, somebody asked, how 9 out of 10 problems start in the brain? Well, look at this. Look at this. Your vagus nerve, which is not vagus as it's lazy. Your vagus nerve, look, comes from the brain. And look at all the things it touches. Your liver, your stomach, your heart, your lungs, your um, um, trachea here, your larynx, your spleen, your kidneys, all your intestinal tract, all from one vagus nerve. If there's brain deterioration because of these patterns, these things are going to get affected. No wonder we have all these problems. I mean, I, I don't know how, how else to put it. There's other patterns and other things, and we're going to uncover them later. But these are the things that are the root of the problem that I've seen. Once, once a person starts changing their lifestyle, they're just like, oh, I feel so much better. Yes, you do. You're changing these patterns. So you tell me I cannot eat bread? No, I'm not telling you to eat not to eat bread. You tell me not to eat pasta? No, it's not to eat not eat pasta. It is, you got to be, you got to understand what it does to your body and the reactions that it has in your body. And then you can make a wise decision. Not like never eats it, it's just be more cautious, be more, more alert what's going on in your body. Okay? And I finish with a verse, Isaiah 1 8. It says, God says, Come now and let us reason together. And that's what God wants. He wants to reason. So, in order to do that, you have to have a good diet. You have to have a healthy diet, a good lifestyle. Um, any questions before we finish here? The amygdala is there to alert you of problems. For example, let me engage my amygdala. Um, let me just show you how I'm going to engage my amygdala. Right now, my amygdala is very engaged. You see, why is it engaged? Because I am walking through here, right? And, and it is in alert mode because I can, I can fall over something. I can hit something. I can get, you know, trapped with something. So it's in alert mode. I'm in alert mode. That's why I say, if you're driving, you should not be eating. Because when you're driving, you're, you're focusing on the road, and there may be a car coming by. There might, so you're in alert mode. You're not going to be in digestion mode. It's either, it's either sympathetic or parasympathetic. It's either one or the other. So when you're in alert mode, 
you're not in digestion or relax mode. So you should not be eating while you're running around. It's just not, doesn't work. And the same thing with your life. If you're always in alert mode, it's just, for example, I have people with anxiety problems. First thing I do, stop eating. How can I stop eating? Yeah, it's just juice. You should not be eating if you're in, we have anxiety because you're not going to be digesting anything. You just, it doesn't, it stays there. So just, just juice. Juice, 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 as much as you want. There, you need more juice? Get more juice. Do your own juice. Do more juice. More juice until you, until you relax yourself enough that you can digest. So um, the amygdala needs to get um, retrained again by engaging that frontal lobe. And we'll talk about later how do we engage that frontal lobe, the next class on the brain. How do we engage that frontal lobe so that we can start getting the metrics of getting our life back together? Okay, any other questions?